Welcome to Wide Advice, a regular podcast aimed at financial clarity and demystifying financial advice. My name is Daniel Crow. I am joined by Peter Mansell of Mansell Financial Group. Peter is also Manag- managing director of FYG Planners, a financial advice dealer group. Welcome, Peter. Hi, Daniel. Good to be here again. All right. So this is an incredibly important topic um, we're going to do today. It's it's on frauds and fraudulent behaviour around financial advice. Uh, it's been prompted by the Melissa Caddick situation in Sydney. Uh, she has gone missing. $13 million are allegedly missing. ASIC are on the case. Uh, we should state she was not a financial advisor. She was acting as one. She was not licensed. Um, it's alleged she was using another advisor's AFSL, but even if she was an advisor, there have been other instances of advisors in the news in 2020 who have defrauded investors, which uh, it, it's just a terrible situation. We can't believe it's still happening. Uh, it is a very, very sad outcome when anyone, you know, perpetrates fraud and and, and masquerades as, as a financial advisor, because of course that's got to undermine community confidence. And, and that's a terrible outcome for the broader population. Unfortunately, Frauds prevalent, you know, in in so many areas of life, you know, things like cyber crime and the like, you know, it, it's there. Uh, there are awful people, you know, in small numbers across all facets of life in the community, and unfortunately, uh, there are people of that nature that see financial advice as their opportunity to to take advantage of poor, unsuspecting investors. A, a really sad outcome, and something that you know at a government level and, and at a regulator level and at a profession level, we've got to do everything possible to try and stamp it out. Uh, and at the same time, investors have got to try and take some, some very important basic steps to make sure that they never end up the victims. For anyone out there thinking of using an advisor, if they have an advisor, this is why we're doing that. As you, as you touched on, we think this podcast will be incredibly valuable for an investor to try and keep themselves safe. So we want to sort of go through a few things to look out for, but do you think there needs to be, as you're saying there, at least some knowledge buy-in when using an advisor? We understand it's about delegation, but these people prey on, on the lack of knowledge. That's certainly the case, and and I've seen examples of it in the past where unsuspecting, overly trusting people um, didn't undertake the most basic of checks and sadly end up being taken advantage of. You know, when any relationship with a financial advisor starts, every consumer should know and definitely should be told the very first thing an advisor has to do if they're going to engage with a, a retail client to provide personal financial advice is they must provide a financial services guide document. Now, if if the advisor also uh, has an involvement in, in lending, that'll be a financial services and credit guide document, fundamentally the same things. And, and that document sets out who the advisor is, who their licensee is, the range of services that they're allowed to provide. It'll also include in it very basic things like the AFSL's uh, uh, number that's registered with ASIC, the advisor's number that's registered as per the financial advisor register. And it'll also spell out the types of fees and charges that that advisor expects a client to pay for. It's, It's very basic, it's in a very prescriptive form and it's a document that at least gives the end consumer the ability to investigate via the financial advisor register whether the person purporting to be an advisor actually is a licensed advisor. It gives them the ability to also investigate the licensee that the advisor is purporting to represent. And it also gives them uh, access to information about what they would do if they ever wanted to make a complaint about that person's behaviour. So that's the very first step uh, that every potential uh, a client of an advisor should ensure that they take the time to obtain that document, read it, understand it, and investigate those few basic things. And that way, they'll at least know they are dealing with a registered advisor with a current AFSL and they'll know the services they can provide and what they can expect to pay 
and how they would go about complaining if they felt the need. Yeah, so that that document, it should be, if an advisor has a website, not every advisor may have a website, but it should be available on their website. That's that's right, Peter? Absolutely. If there is a website, that it should be there. Um, and equally, if they're meeting uh, with an advisor in person for the first time, it should be given to them and explained thoroughly in that very first meeting. Right. I guess one, one other thing we also wanted to highlight, I just wanted to touch on too, is that because uh, occasionally you hear people complain about poor investment performance, but poor investment performance isn't necessarily fraud. It's just poor investment performance and you can't control markets through investments. Certainly. Uh, there's a very, very big difference between fraud and, and advice that turns out not to deliver the result an expector might have hoped for at a particular point in time. Financial markets move in a very, very random manner. Um, the share market, probably the most notable of those and, and one that gets publicity, you know, every, every day through the, ra- the, the media, whether it be radio, television, um, you know, via the internet or, or even through the print media, you know, stock market prices are, are quoted every day. Um, markets do um, perform, as I said, in a random manner. Um, share markets tend to go up about two uh, times out of every three and go down one out of every three period that you might measure. Um, if the investment happens to have done poorly just before the time that an investor wants to take their money out to use for some other purpose, um, then they may well be disappointed. Uh, but that's certainly not a sign of fraud. Um, that's unfortunate timing. Uh, and whether the investment was right for them or wrong, or whether it was a good or bad investment is certainly not an indicator of fraud at all. And on the, on the flip side, a lot of these frauds, because we were just talking about uh, poor performance there, a lot of these frauds um, or someone in this instance um, that we're talking about may have used performance uh, as a lure. So that's another thing to be aware of, having a little bit of understanding of what's possible, the range of potential gain or loss, because we know that no one gets a 20% compounding return year on year right? That's, that's right, isn't it, Peter? Absolutely. Uh, if, if an investment is promoted to you because of a high expected return, and particularly if it's promoted as, as not being risky in the process, uh, every investor should run. There's no free lunch with investing at all. Financial markets do what they do. On average, investors get the average return of the markets they invest in, whether they be fixed interest securities markets, whether they be uh, property securities markets, whether they be share markets. At the end of the day, the aggregate performance for everyone that invests, amateur or professional, ends up being the index or the average rate of return. And that's, that's the only thing that investors can aim for with complete certainty, uh, and that's by buying into that index with a reliable provider. If anybody promotes, you know, superior performance, you know, with any form of alleged certainty attached to it, every investor should be incredibly wary um, because there is no free lunch when it comes to investing. Yeah, we've got an episode on investment philosophies coming, which may, may be a, a pretty good companion uh, to this podcast. So that's something to ask for. How do you generate returns? Or maybe a better question, how do you expect to generate returns and, and how have you generated them in the past? Because then you can look into how they've done this and what they've done. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely essential that investors should understand the investment beliefs and philosophy of whoever they're going to take advice from. And they should understand where any historical returns you know, have come from. If the, the purported advisor you know, claims that they can predict markets, claims that they can pick you know, the winning companies or, or the best bond issues and the like, all I'd say is be incredibly careful. You know, after 40 years of, of being in this business, um, I can say financial markets performance is such a random series of outcomes. Anyone that promotes any ability to predict or forecast should be viewed through very, very sceptical eyes and, and, and what they might have to say or promote uh, treated with great, great caution.
It's interesting too, because we're talking about there, it's coming from uh, the person who's promoting themselves. But I think in, in some of these instances, um, a lot of people get um, hooked by someone else and it's not necessarily the, um, the promoter or the, the fraudulent advisor. It's, it's a client who's already been in there and been uh, getting these fraudulent returns. So then they go and tell someone else about their fraudulent returns and they get excited about it. And it, you know, they're getting referrals um, that aren't necessarily, or they're genuine, but they're not necessarily genuine. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, we saw a great example of this, you know, from the US uh, a, few, a number of years back that got made into a movie about the life of Bernie Madoff, you know, yeah. uh, with, with Robert De Niro as the lead actor. You know, at the end of the day, um, the commencing, you know, or the underpinning of that whole story is he was a fraud that could sell his story to a number of investors who then sold it to others, who sold it to others, who sold it to others, and there ends up being a colossal amount of wealth destroyed, you know, through that fraud. It is really unfortunate because um, where the investors in the early stages think they are getting a great deal, they get excited about it and they want to tell other people. Um, and, 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 and even that is, is probably, um, based from a belief that initially they'd like to think that they found the person that actually knows all the answers. Yep. And, and, and that's the saddest bit, you know, people, people want hope that that's natural in all facets of life. Um, but, but they hope that they've found the guy or the girl, you know, that's got all the answers. And, and in the early stages, if they think that's the case, they do, they want to tell everyone. And unfortunately, you know, the fraud can snowball into, into very, very large amounts. You know, the girl that you referred to earlier, you know, with $13 million, you know, gone missing, you know, what a terrible outcome that is. But unfortunately, it's not abnormal. I can think of similar events that even go back into the 1980s and 1990s, you know, with similar size frauds, it's just tragic. Yeah, something you touched on there was um, the early people um, and and what they they thought that thought their returns were because I actually noticed in in one of the reports for, in the Sydney Morning Herald um, there was a there was a quote from an unnamed investor who'd um, put a million dollars in with their SMSF and they were wondering where they were going to get their million dollars back but they were also um, wondering about where their I think it was seven hundred thousand dollars in returns and I thinking to myself well those returns don't even exist. So they've got, they've got another mental hurdle to overcome that they've possibly lost their million dollars, but their, their 1.7 million didn't even exist in the, the extra 700 didn't exist in the first place. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of investors that take these, these massive bets that prove to be so sad and tragic, um, they get so emotionally invested in the expectation of what's been allegedly promised to them and unfortunately it becomes their truth when it couldn't be further from the truth um, but they want to believe it in the first instance then they get really heavily emotionally invested in it and and the end results just tragedy and uh, and failure uh, it's 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 really sad but unfortunately there are there are people out in the community uh, for whom that mindset is 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 the way they think about money. It's really sad. Yeah, as we touched on before there, um, she was using someone else's AFSL. So in, in that instance, FYG does pretty in-depth uh, background checking before bringing an advisor under their umbrella. But um, obviously in this instance, there was no AFSL. But as you point out before, you agree the best starting point for a potential client is the financial advisor's register, just, just to check that someone is, is licensed? Absolutely. It's a, it's a publicly available tool that's managed by ASIC. Uh, I can assure you that it's actually really difficult to get incorrect information onto the financial advisor register. Uh, and I can say hand on heart that the information that is contained on there, you know, is incredibly accurate. So what you find there, you can have great faith in. And if it's not there, don't believe it at all. You know, there's no such thing as someone who tried to put information on the financial advisor register and they lost it 
or you know it somehow got deleted, uh, I can assure you that adding people to the financial advisor register is the responsibility of the Australian Financial Services licensee and removing of someone from the financial advisor register is also the responsibility of the Australian Financial Services licensee. You know, I've been involved in doing it many times in the past and there is no other way the information gets there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point actually, just to make sure that everyone does check that because all you have to do is put financial advisor register into Google. I'm pretty, much, I'm pretty certain it's the first thing that shows up. Yep. And, and, and the financial advisor register also has the history of the advisor going back, you know, quite a few years. So if they've moved from one licensee to another, um, that information is there. Uh, it, it's a very, very powerful tool that, that every prospective client should take the opportunity to use just to make sure that they're dealing with someone that is as legitimate as they claim to be. So another thing we want to touch on there's there's also being aware of the of the psychology at play. Um, from what I've read um, in this instance, uh, Melissa Caddy put up a veneer of exclusivity, which was probably needed. She was in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that's a hook, but I believe uh, clients would contact her, and as she would initially say, books were closed. And that, there's your veneer of exclusivity. I mean, we know of advisors who don't take on clients, but then miraculously, a few weeks later, there's a spot opening. So now it's a matter of urgency. And so this is basically a sales tactic, right? Absolutely. There's no question about that. You know, it, it is true that some advisors limit the number of clients that they serve. And that's a completely reasonable course of action to take um, if you want to deliver on all your promises that you want to make to clients and you know you've only got a certain number of hours available to work you know, in every week, month or year, um, it, it's absolutely fair to assume that there's, uh, and to understand that there's only so many clients that each individual advisor can deliver quality service to. But the notion of a spot opening up, uh, frankly, you know, that should immediately be an alarm bell uh, that, that any prospective investor just runs away from. You know, if there's any reason uh, that's portrayed to indicate that there's a time frame that advice has to be delivered, investments have to be made, access has to be gained, just run. Um, it's almost certainly a lure to take an action that won't be well considered that won't be well researched and won't be well understood. Yeah. And a, a real financial, a real financial advisor isn't going to sell you on something. And you could speak to the fact that uh, we've seen many instances where people are surprised and maybe even confused because there's, there's no hard sell when they come in to either talk to you or any of our advisors or, or any of the FYG advisors. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it comes down to one of the most basic things and that's informed consent. You know, if you're going to act as a professional who acts for the other person, um, you've got to do everything within your power and, and it's an obligation at law uh, to make sure that they understand fully what it is that they'll be doing. And that's the whole basis of informed consent. And, and in, if there's a rush to get things done, if there are shortcuts taken, you know, in, in allowing the end consumer to get that genuine understanding, um, then the end consumer should understand that's not professional advice. You know, uh, with, with the exception of someone with a dire health condition, you know, that might be going to take their life or impair them permanently, you know, how many times do you see, you know, a medical profession saying, well, you've got to have this today, you know, uh, unless it's a dire uh, potential outcome, that never happens, you know. Uh, if, if you've got to have major, minor or routine surgery, it's routine for the surgeons. They say, well, this is what I think we need to do. You should go away and think about this, make sure you're happy with it. And then let's, you know, let's talk about this again at a certain point in time where the surgeon thinks it's appropriate. And, and that's the way it should also be with financial advice. You know, I know in, in our own case, you know, all of our advice is provided to clients after an extensive, you know, introductory discussion, investigative process, documented advice that the client takes away has time to consider and they only implement after that full process 
has been undertaken. Uh, certainly no new client of, of our firm, or for that matter, any other FYG firm, would ever expect to turn up on day one and suddenly be pressured that this has got to be done in a hurry. You know, it's, it's just not the way things work with, with proper professional advice. Yeah, and I guess on, on the, when, you, when the money comes uh, from the investor uh, to the advisor, it seems in, in some of these instances, quite often money is going into the advisor's accounts or someone's family trust or, or something like that. So what's the process to look out for around placing money with someone to invest? Because we use third-party custodians, right, platforms and... And yes. Could you speak to that? Absolutely. So firstly, the, the actual advice should be given in writing. And in that written advice, it should say absolutely plainly and clearly where the client funds are going to come from and where they're going to go to. Uh, and right down to the, the name of the third party custodian that you referred to in, in introducing the question. So if ever, ever, an investor is asked to make out a check to the advisor, the advisor's company, the advisor's family trust, some sort of trust account, just run. Because most AFSLs, not all, because you've got firms like stockbrokers where there's an exception, but most AFSLs are not even allowed to run a trust account. So they can't even run a bank account that washes clients' money through it to get to where it's meant to go to. Um, in the case of FYG planners, every advisor has to make certain that client funds are payable to the custodian of the investments that the client's actually buying. Never, never, ever do the funds flow via the advisor or any of their personally controlled entities. If that's ever promoted to someone, they should just literally run. Yeah, that should be a red flag from the beginning or if there's, there's ever a change. So, if, you know, you've been sending your money to a certain and then all, all of a sudden, oh, you know, uh, redirect it to this because there's been some sort of uh, change in our business. It should, it should always stay with the third party custodian, right? 100%. It won't change. If the client's got an investment, whether it be non-superannuation or superannuation with, with XYZ, you know, platform or product provider, um, then their nominated bank account is the place that money should go to and come from without exception. Yeah. So there would also be a secondary ability to check a balance, right? I mean, in some instances, some advisors may have an online login where you can check your balance or maybe there's a paper statement generated by the custodian on a quarterly, semi-annual or, or annual basis. Um, it's an obligation of all the uh, product and platform providers in Australia that they have to provide no less than annual statements. And for most, in fact, it's no less than half yearly. Uh, and uh, in, in pretty much every instance, uh, the end investor's got the ability to either uh, go into an internet site of that product provider, put in login codes that would have been provided to them at the outset and go and view their account records. Um, second to that, uh, every one of the major providers will also have a call centre where you can ring and ask questions about your account balance and the like. Um, and, and as a result, clients have always got access to the independent provision of information about their accounts from their actual providers. It doesn't just come from the advisor. Doesn't mean an advisor can't prepare reports, statements, uh, you know, summaries and the like to, to deliver to clients, but they will absolutely not be the only form of statement that clients receive. You know, I've, I've seen personally a very, a very sad outcome back uh, around the uh, uh, the end of the 20th century, the start of the new millennium, uh, where uh, a particular fraud, you know, was preparing uh, false statements, much as Bernie Madoff did, uh, for people from whom he, he gained an excessive amount of trust. And as it turned out, he was nothing but a crook. Uh, and, and those statements were not worth the paper they were printed on. Uh, the investors, sadly, wanted to believe they were accurate, but of course, in the end, they were not. Um, other people that this same person that I'm thinking of dealt with that had legitimate accounts were of course getting statements from fund managers and platform providers and, and super fund trustees 
exactly as they should have. I think in this instance, there was, I, I read in the article that um, she'd been setting up Comsec accounts on, on their, their behalf. So well, what's the process around that when someone's trying to tell you that, oh, we'll set up these individual accounts with you that I can um, have access to and um, from, from that perspective? I think in a couple of cases, the, the people found out the, Com, the Comsec accounts weren't actually even set up. So... Does that just get back to the third party custody? What if someone's trying to tell you that he oh he's this broking account with Comsec or or something like that? Well, if if that's promoted to someone and it turns out that it is fraudulent, of course, trying to access that wouldn't be possible. So in the first instance, if if any end investor were given details of a Comsec or for that matter any other account, the absolute first thing they should do is actually go and try and log into it. And if you can't log into it, you know, don't be prepared to put any money into it. At the end of the day, if it hasn't been set up legitimately, you won't be able to in the first instance. Um, so I'd be going to the, the alleged provider's website, trying to use the details that have been provided to log in. And if that doesn't work, you know that you're not dealing with someone that legit, that's legitimate. That's one of the, one of the concerning things with this is always it's, uh, it, the frauds always skew older and we know that they skew older because um, older people naturally are going to have more wealth. They're going to have more liquid um, savings. They've accumulated uh, more. And I kind of have a theory that you have a certain number of financial mistakes allowed in your life. And I think this should apply to everyone that these mistakes totally expire after 50, you don't get to make them anymore because the further you go along in your, li in your life, the less chance that you have to recover from disaster because if you're in your 50s or 60s, uh, there's no chance you can uh, recover from something like this because your earning capacity in terms of length or longevity isn't there anymore and you just don't have the ability to uh, take as much risk also to um, generate returns. 100%. And unfortunately, it's an absolute truism that, that the vast majority of fraud does happen to older people. And I think um, you've commented on it very well. Uh, older folks generally have accumulated their wealth over their lifetime. Um, secondly, uh, as people get older, most need to trust others more. They, you know, many investors I've observed over the years have, have gradually um, lost confidence as maybe a bit stronger phrase, but their confidence gradually erodes. And, and, and as a result, they want help. And that's when they really need, you know, a caring advisor and, and a legitimate advisor that'll do the right thing. But unfortunately, it's also at that time in their life where, where they're vulnerable to being taken advantage of, you know, the, uh, whether it be the, the last Michelle that you referred to earlier or, or the earlier case that I remember back in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, um, the average age of the people that that fellow took advantage of was certainly north of 70. Um, and, and as you say, you know, their earning careers are over. They, they had no ability to make up for what was stolen from them. Um, and so, you know, investors that are reaching that time of their lives where they feel even more need for help because they're having less confidence in their own ability, you know, to manage their investment decisions. Those are the people that have to be the most careful to make sure they do just those basic investigations in the first instance thoroughly and make sure that they do ask that the I's be dotted and the T's crossed uh, and, and make sure that they only ever pay money across to the end institution that's going to manage their investments for them. Yeah, as you touched on there, it's a... a it's an incredibly traumatic event um, to have some sort of, it is, well, it's financial trauma in, in some respect. So um, not only do you have the, the financial loss, you've got the, the mental um, problems and maybe even it could generate health problems mm. that uh, yep. are going to come because you, your life is going to change dramatically. Yeah, absolutely. I can think of, of one particular instance of a Melbourne couple that I know um, where uh, the husband now with hindsight admits that, you know, it was, it was greed uh, or, or you might even call it, you know, bordering on a gambling streak, you know, that caused him to chase, you know, very high returns. 
um, on investments that, that he really believed weren't risky. And unfortunately, he got too emotionally invested in those beliefs and they proved to be wrong. So not only did it you know, cause a massive erosion in the couple's wealth, and when I say massive, they lost about 70% of their wealth. Um, it strained their marriage really badly. Uh, it, it, they went within a whisker of separating, which would have been even worse for both of them financially as well. Um, it caused enormous stress to uh, a son who, who got involved to try and help them um, and an and enormous frustration to a, a daughter and family that lived not far away. You know, it, it really did tear the very fabric of the family. Um, and it was all because of a combination of sort of greed, um, gambling, if you like, and someone else who was willing to make them promises that were never actually deliverable. Yeah. Yeah. Really unbelievable. These things that um, they can actually do to you and and your family. And it it just spreads as you've, as you've noticed, just go through your whole family. Like the people who are involved in these situations are, you should say it's the worst time it can happen. It's coming up to Christmas. They're getting a really, really rude shock and it's not going to be a a good time, but it's just going to send reverberations across uh, them, the people they know, um, and they're not going to have a healthy time over the new year. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the, the, that particular example I gave, like uh, before the fraud took place, they were able to provide support to a couple of grandsons with respect to their education and what have you. And, and I'm certain that the, the mother and father of those, those grandchildren, you know, we're expecting that to continue, but of course it couldn't. So that put stress on their budget. Um, and, and so, as you say, the, the, the effects, they, they go out from, from that fraud. I know that the, the particular couple had a strong involvement with, you know, a, a, a prominent Victorian golf club that they've had to curtail, you know, that was, you know, absolutely gut-wrenching for them to think that their circle of friends that they used to spend a lot of time with at that golf course, they're now not able to be at that golf course because they're not members anymore. Um, It it, it has massive long-term effects, not only for those that are duped by the unscrupulous, uh, but their extended families are often impacted badly as well. So I wanted to finish up on something that's a little different, maybe a little light or sort of quirky. Um, it may surprise you and it may, may highlight to everyone else that, that people aren't always going to be the veneer that they present or what you even expect. Um, so John Hampton, who runs the hedge fund Bronte Capital um, in Sydney, um, he's a known short seller and whatever you think of short sellers, um, John's actually rooted out a lot of frauds at a company level. Um, so he's actually got a good track record and he's, he's not just attacking companies for the sake of it. Um, and short selling obviously takes a lot of research and, um, he's actually, he's got a database of scoundrels around the world. And, uh, there's, there's one group that's overrepresented in this database, he says, and it's Mormons. Right. And uh, this, these are his words. Um, Mormons are pound for pound the best salespeople in the world. The reason is obvious. If you are 19 and you go on go missionary, you are selling religion door to door. And if you can sell religion door to door, you can sell anything. It's the best training for sale for a sales job anywhere. And he said that probably 10% of America's dodgy frauds have some sort of Mormon connection. Right. Well, I guess it is fair to say that in a modern society, uh, it wouldn't be easy to sell religion of any faith, I might add, you know, door to door. Um, I, I can certainly agree with that. And if, if someone's got the courage to do that routinely, then they'd probably have the courage to sell anything else routinely. So I'm suspicious that uh, whilst I wouldn't necessarily support um, the, the percentages or the data because I haven't had a chance to look at it, but the principle of, you know, if you can sell um, religion door to door, you could probably sell anything else. I don't find that hard to uh, to accept. I really don't. Yeah. 
I just thought, I just thought it was an interesting thing that just, just to find that when I read that, I was like, yeah, that's unbelievable. And then, yeah, when, when you actually do think about it, if someone has that, uh, cause it's almost, you've gone out get training in the hardest, uh, hardest sales, uh, profession there is really. Yeah. And look, you know, being in sales, as you know, is not for everyone, you know, class classically uh, sales people are often rejected and most, most, adult humans don't like being rejected. So, you know, a sales environment's not necessarily something for everyone at all. And, and wow, if you can go and knock door to door, you know, and try and sell a religious message, I suspect that's even harder than, you know, going door to door and trying to sell a political message. Um, but if you can do it, uh, you may well be able to pick up the phone and, and talk to anyone uh, about anything, you know, and I, I know, you know, in the past, I've even taken calls from people, you know, that were supposedly selling great investments from an office in Bangkok. I remember one time and I remember this guy with an American accent um, saying that, you know, when I, when I challenged what he was offering and I said, Hey, you know, and, and I posed this question, he said, I'm not some sort of flim flam man. I said, well, look, you know, if you really believe this is such a good idea, you ring me back in another month's time and never heard from him ever again. So it was obvious. He, he, he just had a whole bunch of names, a whole bunch of phone numbers, and he's just ringing trying to find anybody that was willing to take the bait. Um, luckily, I'd had my dinner that night and I wasn't hungry. No bait taken. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I guess, I guess we'll sum this up. Um, so we'll just go back through it. Number one, look for licensing on the financial advisors register. Absolutely. Can't go wrong there. Um, understand what is possible from an, an investment perspective? 100%. You know, the, every advisor uh, that, that's a true professional and will act in the best interest of their clients can provide you with any amount of data, you know, going back you know, over 100 years to show you what financial markets deliver. And, and that's the sort of results people should expect. Anyone that promises more than that, you know, will probably tell you lies about other things as well. Uh, as for the investment philosophy, uh, get them to explain how past returns were generated. And I guess you could also ask if, if you're being put into a portfolio, you need to see um, the best and worst returns for that portfolio because they should want to show you the worst just so you, you can actually understand um, how to ride out a bad market. If they're trying to tell you that there's not a, not a worst, that's a big concern, right? Absolutely. They've got to be prepared to, to show you the downsides really explicitly. Uh, by, by way of example, you know, if you think back to some of the big events uh, in financial markets over the last 40 years, you know, the stock market crash of 1987 saw share markets fall by 22% across the globe in one day. That's possible. It actually happened. Um, you look back before that, you know, 1973, 74, the OPEC oil crisis occurred and global share markets over the space of two years fell all but 60%. We saw something similar in the global financial crisis. And of course, more recently with the, uh, uh, impacts of COVID-19, we saw the markets fall 35% in a month. Those things do happen. Every advisor worth their salt will be absolutely keen to and happy to tell you about those bad times as well as the good times that also inevitably happen. Uh, every investor needs to understand the downside risk of what they're proposing to do as well as the upside potential. Yeah, I think the people who have, have an aversion to those losses, they want to believe that someone out there can save them from them. And this is how they actually do get hooked in. Absolutely. Uh, as, a, as I alluded to earlier, you know, every human wants some hope for the future. And when it comes to money, money helps to deliver a certain lifestyle. Everybody has lifestyle aspirations. So the more money one has, the more readily you can have those lifestyle aspirations. Unfortunately, that little sort of circle tends to feed on itself and, and people want to believe that there's someone that can show them the road, the easy road to riches, and that'll give them the lifestyle that they want. Um, it's that, that unfortunate misplaced belief that often leads people to make, you know, the worst of decisions and end up being taken by fraudsters. Another point to remember, 
there's no sales game at play, whether that's either the hard sell or the uh, trying to pretend that they don't need you because um, they're so exclusive that uh, we've got our books closed and then all of a sudden we're open. Uh, so that's another thing to consider. Absolutely. Uh, I, I only know of one investment house across the world that has a complete exclusivity club uh, that 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 that's publicly known, uh, and and their their whole business model is um, that they'll only invest their own money. Uh, that's that's a pretty good indicator that they might actually be really good at what they do. They don't take any other other clients' money at all. Um, so uh, that's the only exclusive club that I have any familiarity with that actually makes some sense. They never have an opening for someone to get in. Is that, that's the medallion fund you're talking about? Correct. Yep. Um, and the final part, um, your money, and most important, your money sits with a third-party custodian and only goes into a third-party custodian. Absolutely. Uh, any advisor that suggests that you pay any amount of money to an account that they have any control or influence over should absolutely be avoided 100% of the time. Every client that makes legitimate investments pays money across to the actual end fund manager or platform that holds those funds or administration service that holds those assets. Um, advisors don't hold client assets if they're acting in good faith and legitimately. All right. Thanks, Peter. I think what we've got here today, the, hopefully a lot of people hear it. Hopefully a lot of people take notice and hopefully it saves a lot of people from making a really bad mistake with their money or finding themselves involved in a fraud? Absolutely. A few basic things that can be done by any investor can avoid years and years of misery. All right. Thanks for joining us again today, Peter. Okay. Cheers, Daniel. Bye for now. This podcast is for informational purposes only and the information contained is of a general nature and may not be relevant to your particular circumstances. The circumstances of each investor are different and you should seek advice from a professional financial advisor who can consider if particular strategies and products are right for you. In all instances where information is based on historical performance, it is important to understand this is not a reliable indicator of future performance. You should not rely on any material on the podcast to make investment decisions and should always seek professional advice. The hosts and guests of the podcast may have positions in securities mentioned or discussed. Mansell Financial Group is an authorized representative number 226266 and credit representative number 403187 of FYG Planners Proprietary Limited, AFSL ACL number 224543. Thank you for listening to Why Advice.